away, pushers. This is Mr. Rains, and we are going to be preparing together for the AP United States History exam. So let's get started. This is the first lesson of our video series, Period 1, and I hope to include videos for all nine periods of United States history. Now again, the College Board divides United States history into nine different time periods. So you're going to hear me referring often to the different periods, period one, period seven, period three, all the time. Knowing these time periods, rather than memorizing a bunch of random dates, is going to help you organize events for your essays. So keep that in mind as you're taking notes. Now we're going to be doing a lot of different things for each time period, like AMSCO readings and various other assignments, but you're going to be expected to take good lecture notes, and that's what I'm here for. This course emphasizes both content and skills. So we are going to be working on both on a daily basis. To do well, you'll need to master both. My hope is that these videos will help you to easily go back and review material. Or if you're absent, you can view the videos to get quickly caught up with the rest of the class. And if you're not in my class, hopefully these videos will help you prepare for the U.S. history exam also. So let's begin today with period one. Keep in mind, I want to point out that according to the College Board, period one is one of the least tested of the time periods and consists only of approximately 5% of the exam. That doesn't mean we're going to ignore period one, but it will be less emphasized. From what I've seen, period one is usually asked in the form of multiple choice questions. Now period one covers the years 1491 to 1607, Basically, that's pre-Columbus to the settlement of the first English colony in America, which is Jamestown. Now, each lesson, I highlight a figure in history that stands out, and one that I've seen several questions derived on from the AP exam. I like to call this our story of significance. And for period one, our story of significance is Bartolome de la Casas. So let's take a look at his life together. Bartolome de las Casas was a Spanish priest and one of the early explorers on the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean, close to us right here in Florida. Now, as an explorer, the Spanish government allowed las Casas, like many others, to take the natives in the land captives as slaves in a brutal system known as encomienda. Keep in mind, we're going to be discussing the term encomienda more in depth later in this lesson. But after years of settlement and through prayer, it said that Lacassus began to view the brutal system towards the natives as unfair and unjust. He himself witnessed tragedies afflicted upon the natives, and he believed that just like himself, these natives were created in the image of God and therefore deserved better treatment. This led Lacassus to devote the rest of his life to fight for fairer treatment of Native Americans and against their forced enslavement, the incoming into system. Unfortunately, La Casas is a rare exception to the common view of the time toward Native Americans. La Casas' voice stands as a contrast to the Europeans at the time, especially Spanish treatment of the Native Americans. Now this is important to note. It is likely that you're going to encounter questions regarding European contact with Native Americans during the Columbian period. And even in this lesson, we'll examine some generalities between the various groups. But is it, it is very important for you to always to be able to bring in opposing point of view. Point of view is a key skill in a push, and for this, Lacassus is a perfect example of an opposing point of view. Not only that, he's a pretty cool guy in history too. Now, let's take a look at a primary source document. This is a letter written by Lacassus himself. I've seen this excerpt used multiple times by the College Board so I thought it might be a good one for us to review together. Now keep in mind that reading and using primary source documents is something we'll be doing a lot in a push. Your AMSCO readings and exercises will expose you to a lot of primary source documents also. So let's read it together. From the fact that the Indians are barbarians, it does not necessarily follow that they have to be ruled by others, except to be taught about the Catholic faith. They are not ignorant, inhumane, or bestial. Rather, long before they had heard the word Spaniard, they had properly organized states, wisely organized by excellent laws, religion, and custom. The Indians will embrace the teaching of the gospel 
as I well know, for they are not stupid, but have a native sincerity, and are simple, moderate, meek, and finally, such that I do not know whether there is any people readier to receive the gospel. Bartolome de la Casas. Now, a couple things I'd like to point out regarding this passage that I hope you notice too. First, you can see that it is a priority of the Spanish explorers to spread their religion, and in this case, that's the Catholic faith. Now, this will be consistent, not only with the Spanish, but with the French and with the English explorers as well. But even more important for this evaluation is that Lacassus is arguing that the natives are not ignorant savages, as nearly all Europeans had assumed they were, but rather they're very intelligent, maybe even sophisticated. Now, when we look later at the Aztec kingdom, for instance, you will see that many Native Americans, though different in their culture, could be said to be just as advanced as the Europeans, especially in the area of the three A's that we'll be talking about. Those three A's are agriculture, architecture, and astronomy. Agriculture, architecture, astronomy, three A's. Hopefully, though, you can see that Lacassus is offering us an opposing point of view. Now, remember him because you may need that point of view in future assignments. I always recommend that students build for themselves go-to terms from each period that they could pull from when needed for essays. So let's dive right in with the lecture. Let's start with Roman numeral one. Now keep in mind that these notes are primarily for you to understand and organize the key concepts from each period. Not everything we will you we not everything we discuss will you see typed in the PowerPoint. However, that does not mean it's not important. I recommend in class, or if you're taking notes at home, use abbreviations, make side comments about both what you hear and see. But don't get so caught up in the writing that you miss out on participating. The more you become invested in this material, the more likely it's going to stick. I say push yourself in class to ask questions, make connections across time periods, and trust me, it's going to pay off in the end when you get that five on the AP exam. Now, Roman numeral one says this, the first Americans. Now, the question I often get asked is, when does American history really begin? Should we start with the Native Americans, because they were here first? Or what about Leif Erikson, or maybe another explorer like Columbus? Or does American history really start with the first English-speaking colony at Jamestown? Now, I've heard some even argue that American history really doesn't begin until 1776 with the signing of the Declaration of Independence. But for our purposes, we will look at pre-Columbian civilizations, but only hitting on them briefly, and we'll spend a much more considerable amount of time discussing European settlements in the New World. Now, the New World was not unsettled by long shot. What is clear is that when Columbus or any of the other European settlers first arrived in the New World, it had already been settled for thousands of years, some argue maybe even longer. But if human civilization began in the Middle East, how did Native Americans get here? Now many historians and scientists have argued for years that during the period known as the Ice Age, that the continents could have been connected, maybe by a land bridge that allowed humans to cross from Siberia into what we know today as Alaska. Following food sources such as the buffalo, people groups could have traveled further and further south and inland. And then with the melting away of the ice bridge, it is argued, this separated the Americas from the rest of the world for thousands of years. Now, more recently, there's been some doubts about this land bridge theory that's been taught for so many years, and some have suggested that maybe small groups of people came over simply by boats. Well, whichever the case, we know that when Europeans arrived starting in around 1492, it really did appear to them to be a new world, but one filled with millions of previously unknown people, animals, and plants. It wasn't unsettled. Now here's a good map to show you what is believed to be the crossing uh, into the New World on the land bridge. Now let's move on to Roman numeral two. Roman numeral two is going to talk a little bit about 
native civilizations. Now, as we mentioned, there are millions of Native Americans living in the New World when the Europeans began to arrive. However, it is important to note that there were actually very few large community groups. To survive and catch food made a sedentary lifestyle impossible. So you wouldn't see many big populated cities. Now, I'll emphasize that again. Most Native American groups, no matter what tribe you might be looking at, did not consist of large community groups, but rather smaller groups that traveled chasing food, most notably the buffalo. Now, an exception to this that I want to spend some time looking at are the tribes in Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica had the largest of the civilizations. This map here will give you an idea where this is located. Now, you might be familiar with uh, large civilizations like the Mayan, Inca, and Aztecs, and they originated from this region. Now, for many Europeans who once thought that Native Americans are uncivilized people, when they came across these larger civilizations, they were very impressed by what they seen. Now, let's look at this quote. Some of the soldiers among us who had been in many parts of the world said that they had never seen such a large a marketplace and so full of people and so well regulated and arranged. And this was regarding the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan. So if I said that most civilizations are small and there's very few large ones, what made these different? These large civilizations had one thing in common, and that is agriculture. One of the key crops that many of these groups centered their livelihoods around was maize, or Indian corn. So let me repeat it. Farming groups are naturally the bigger groups. Now, why didn't everybody farm? Well, farming is not easy considering weather, insects, supply of water, good soil. One bad year could, to, could devastate an entire tribe. But for these tribes, living in Mesoamerica, they developed very sophisticated farming techniques and irrigation that provided for long-lasting crops with annual yields of abundance. But how did they do that? Well, one technique that they used was called three sister farming. Corn provided starches, beans the proteins, and squash the vitamins. Three crops that provided for all of their health needs, and three crops that work together to ward off insects to provide for a good soil year after year. Now, European explorers into this region would be so impressed by three sister farming that they would take these farming practices and apply them back in Europe. Now, I want to stop here for a moment and point out that these Native American groups, like the Aztecs, are altering their environment through farming practices like three sister farming, and they will grow into thriving civilizations that are impressive, not only to other Native Americans, but to the Europeans that will arrive. Not only that, but this would have huge social implications as well. Living in big communities with fewer concerns about food allowed individuals opportunities to do much more, expand their knowledge, develop inventions, study the stars, explore nature. Some would even become artisans, soldiers, priests, and so much more. They had more opportunities because of crops like the maize. Now, it would be hard, hard to argue that the Aztecs or any of these other groups are not sophisticated or advanced. However, it should be pointed out that some behaviors were clearly abhorrent to the Europeans, most notably the Aztec practice of human sacrifice. Obviously, that wouldn't be something they would want to emulate and bring back to Europe. Here, let's take a look at this uh, illustration. It'll show you three sister farming, which is still used today. You th use three different crops that work together. Here it says the corn supports the beans. The beans add nitrogen and the squash shades out the weeds. How ingenious that these Native Americans could come up with such sophisticated practices. Now, many Native tribes worshipped aspects of nature. Pictured here is the goddess of corn. This idea is known as animism, or the worship of plants, animals, or other aspects of nature. Many Native American tribes 
did believe in these types of practices. For them, the corn sustained their civilization. Therefore, they should worship the corn. So let's continue. We're going to look at the different regions of Native American tribes. Um, we looked at how some tribes remained small as others grew and why that was the case. But the study of Native groups more specifically, like what tribe did what, would be labor intensive in and of itself, really is beyond the scope of this course. Rather, I would like to teach you a couple simplistic specifics, that was hard to say, simplistic specifics regarding regions that distinguish particular Native American groups. Now you're going to get a lot more in your reading from AMSCO, but I hope that this simplistic rendition is going to help you uh, to be able to differentiate between the different tribes by region. So let's first look at the region of the Arctic subarctic. So here in this map, you get an idea of exactly where that would be located. Now, these Native Americans survived some of the coldest weather on the planet. How did they do that? These people include the Inuit or the Eskimo people of, of Alaska, and they would live primarily off of whale and seal meat. And they adapted to their environment by living in igloos. So that is where we get the idea of the igloos is from the Arctic, subarctic region of Native Americans. So another group I'd like you to look at or another region I would like you to look at is the Great Basin, Great Plains region. So again, if you look at the map, this is where that is going to be located. Now here, lack of natural resources led these tribes to live more nomadic lifestyles meaning they're going to be traveling for their food. They're known as nomadic people and buffalo hunters. Now, something to point out even here is, unlike the Europeans who would come and hunt the buffalo for fun, leave the remains to rot, these native groups would hunt the buffalo and not leave any part unused. Buffalo meat, of course, provided food, but buffalo bones could be carved to make knives and boiled to make glue. And buffalo skin could be used to make all kinds of things. Their teepees, clothes, moccasins. So they did not leave any part unused. And their housing would be teepees. Of course, you've heard of those before. And here is a picture as an example. So we got the Arctic, Subarctic, the Great Basin, Great Plains. The next region I want to look at is the Southwest. And I've highlighted there at the bottom for you so you have an idea of where that is. You could think... Arizona, New Mexico. And if you were to think of that, you would know immediately that is going to be a very hot, dry region. Very dry. Because of this, uh, they would have to adopt, uh, adapt. And so these Indians living in this region uh, were skilled in water conservation and irrigation. Very impressive techniques of water harvesting, um, large man-made canals, trenches, dams, all kinds of things, which, again, the Europeans would be very impressed by. And the other thing is their homes would be adobe-type homes. Uh, and if you look at the top right, you can see an example of what that might look like. So we got southwest, and next we got the northwest. So here you see on the map where that would be located also. In the northwest region, these um, native tribes often would center their livelihood off of catching fish. And one of the most notable examples is the salmon. For many of these tribes, the salmon would not only be food, but a spiritual symbol. For the Northwest uh, Native tribes, these are where you would see the totem poles that I'm sure you are familiar with. You could look here, I have a picture of what a totem pole might look like. And finally, their houses were long houses. So look at the bottom left for an example of that. Next, let's look at the Northeast region and the native tribes that lived there. Now for the Northeast region, here's the map. You can see where that is located. For the Northeast, they are going to be hunter-gatherers, a mixture of both. Uh, but for this region, one of the things that I want to point out is what ends up happening in this region when it comes to American history. Now, often when we think of Native Americans, we sometimes think they're all the same people with a similar culture, language, religion, whatever. This is basically 
how the Europeans viewed the Native Americans at the time. But nothing could be further from the truth. Native American tribes were often bitter rivals, warring against one another. The concept of coming together for a common cause would have been foreign to them. However, after years of exploitation from Europeans uh, coming into America, five tribes from this region would join together to form a confederation, a fighting force known as the Iroquois League. Now we're going to talk a lot more about the Iroquois League in a later lesson, but I just wanted to point it out here as we're going through the different regions. And then lastly, I want to talk about their style of housing. For the Northeast region, you would be seeing wigwams. And here's an example of what that looks like. Now let's look at the Southeast region. Uh, the largest Native American tribe, the Cherokee, lived in the Southeast. These tribes here it is located down here so you can get an idea where that's at. Florida is in the southeast region. These tribes would often be skilled farmers. Um, they tended to stay in one place for a long period of time. And this region is where you would get the five civilized tribes that we're going to be talking about in a later lesson. They were called civilized tribes because they adapted more easily or more willingly to European types of lifestyle, dress, um, education, things like that, and farming practices were often adopted from the Europeans. So they were known as the civilized tribes. And then daub houses, which you see here at the bottom, would be an example of the type of housing used in the southeast region. So hopefully that's going to help you out by knowing the different regions, some similarities, some differences between them, so if you were to get a question about Native American groups, you'll have some information to pull from. Here, I love this chart here as we talked about uh, whether Native Americans were uncivilized or whether they were sophisticated. Well, this chart um, will give you an interesting perspective. Let's look first at population. So at the time, the most populated city in the world was Paris with 300,000 people. But you could look at some of the other uh, cities in America at the time, like Tenochtitlan had 200,000 people. That's pretty impressive. Uh, technological achievements, look at this. You got the calendar, you got writing. Um, I talked about canals and irrigation. But other things like astronomy and mathematics are coming from some of these groups. Uh, architectural achievements, obviously we know about the Great Pyramids of Egypt, but look what they were doing in America during this time period. The, the Monk Mound, the Pyramid of the Sun, very impressive infrastructure. Here again is another example of a cliff dwelling uh, built by Native Americans. So now let's move on to Roman numeral three, which is the growth of exploration. So now that we know native populations existed in America for thousands of years, separated from Europe and the rest of the world, we should ask ourselves, what caused the change? What caused people to want to be motivated to come and explore? Well, I want to go back even further than Columbus and some of these early explorers uh, to an event known as the Crusades. Not wanting to get too deep into the religious nature of these conflicts, you could sum it up to say that the Crusades were a series of religious wars between Christians and Muslims. For our purposes, though, we should note that these Crusades and a mission to spread their faith and their religion, individuals began to travel to new lands beyond their borders. Of course, others had done this before, but it was dangerous leaving your hometown for a variety of reasons. And this prevented it from happening on a large scale, like will begin to happen after the Crusades. Now on these expeditions, some even ventured as far as Asia, where they would encounter precious goods like spices and silks that they would bring back home. And many people would be impressed by these and would want more of these. You can imagine for the first time having a taste of sugar, for example, added to your food. Of course, once you have it as a novelty, you're going to want it more and more, and you are going to want someone to go venture out to try to bring it back. 
So increasingly, people began to push into new lands, not simply for religious converts, though that's going to continue, but to acquire some of these goods and spices. Again, none of this was easy. Many people died traveling difficult trade routes into Asia. And that's why people would be motivated to look for a better, an easier route into Asia to get some of these precious goods. Now in class, we discussed why certain things even have value, like gold. And you could think to yourself about why gold is considered valuable to most people around the world, and it's just a rock. Why is it valuable? But going back to exploration, why now? What spurred this age of exploration? And I'm going to teach you an acronym that's going to help you remember some of the causes of exploration. And this great acronym is this, spunky turtles really prefer rockets. Let me say that again. Spunky turtles really prefer rockets. The first letter in each of those words is going to help you remember some of the causes for the age of expiration. So let's begin with the first. It is spices. Now think of things like sugar and precious goods that would motivate people to want to explore. This is going to be a cause of expiration. So we got our spunky is spices. The turtles, the T is technology. So even if you had the desire, you really want to go, you want to acquire these goods. If you do not have the means to explore, you can't explore. It would take new inventions, better maps to open up the doors for exploration. So that's the T, technology. The first R is Renaissance. Now, of course, we could devote an entire class to the topic of the Renaissance. But what I like to think of when talking about the Renaissance, as I like to call it, the age of curiosity. Yes, this is a period where people began to wonder, wonder about new cultures, what's out there, new art, music, literature, you want to explore. People were ready and eager to adventure out and learn about their world. This is a period of Renaissance, and that's going to motivate people to want to explore. Well, what about P, power, and fame. For most, moving up a socio-economic ladder in Europe or even the rest of the world was nearly impossible. So exploration, though dangerous, could provide an opportunity for someone to be recognized. So why would anyone take a deadly risk unless the potential for success is very great? So that's power and fame. And finally, the last R is religion. Now, religion is going to continue to be a huge motivating factor in exploration. Natives were often forced to convert to new religions, and new lands were claimed for religions, the Catholic faith, the Protestant faith, the Muslim faith, depending on who is sending out the explorers. So there's the acronym again. Spunky turtles really prefer rockets, spices, technology, renaissance, power and fame, and religion. Remember it, and you'll know the causes of exploration. So now let's look at some of the technology. We mentioned technology, but some of the technology that would allow for exploration. We got the astrolobe, which allowed uh, explorers to use the stars to tell time. You got better maps, so you have an idea of where you're going, and people would begin to map places that they had been. Compass, sextant helps determine location. And here, this is pretty impressive, uh, a ship known as the Caravel would be able to sail against the winds. So people could actually cross the Atlantic to get to the new world because of some of these impressive new ships. So let's go on to Roman numeral four, Spanish conquest. Uh, now let's get to the main man, the one we all know and either love or despise. And of course that is Christopher Columbus himself. Now I'm sure you've heard the poem, right? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And I'm sure you've heard his ships, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. We know there's a holiday in his honor, Columbus Day. Many cities in the U.S. are named after Columbus. However, throughout the years, it's been debated vigorously. And we're going to debate it ourselves in class. Was Columbus truly a hero deserving of all the credit we give him? Or was Columbus really a villain 
who decimated Native American populations. Now, I'm going to leave that up to you to decide, and I look forward to our lively discussion in class on the topic. However, what we do know is that Columbus was not seeking to find a new continent. Remember, no one knew that the Americas even existed. Instead, Columbus was looking for a water route into Asia, a quicker route, an easier route to get some of those precious goods. Now, we know the land routes were very dangerous, and he hoped a water route would be very profitable to him. Now, you may have heard that Columbus challenged the prevailing belief at the time of a flat earth. Well, Columbus did believe that the world was round, but so did everybody else. Nearly all educated people during Columbus Day, Columbus's day knew that the world was likely round. What they didn't know was how large the world actually was. Remember, they had no idea that North and South America even exist. But no explorer, not Columbus, not anyone, could finance a trip on their own. So remember I said never thought the world was flat, but he can't finance a trip on his own. Columbus was Italian, but he received his funding from the Spanish royalty, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Though they were reluctant to do so, they did take a gamble on Columbus. They paid for his ex expensive ex expedition to find that water route to Asia. And ultimately, after setting out on his journey, Columbus and his crew would not land in Asia or the West Indies, but rather he would land in the Bahamas. And Columbus, of course, didn't know this, and he called those living in this region Indians. And that name has stuck ever since. Now Columbus, of course, was rather impressed with himself. And we'll later look at some of his uh, journal entries, and you could tell he was really impressed with himself. Not that he had found a new continent, but that he had found what he thought was that water route into Asia. And Columbus would end up taking three additional voyages into the Americas. But unfortunately, Columbus died not knowing the significance of all of it. He thought all along it was Asia he had found. But after Columbus, the floodgates would open up, and eventually European nations would battle each other for control of the New World, the Americas. Spain was first and prominent in early exploration. Most early Spanish explorers during this time period were called conquistadors, because they believed that they would conquer the land and they would also bring the Catholic faith. Remember, Spain is a Catholic country. The motto of these conquistadors is, win souls for the Catholic faith and find gold for the crown. In the process of colonization, though, the Spanish claimed expansive territory that was already occupied by Native American groups, like we talked about. But the Spanish felt it was their prerogative for being Christians to rule over what they considered to be savage, godless Indians. The Spanish would then establish the Encomienda system. In the Encomienda system, they would rule over Native American communities and claimed many Indians as their slaves. They would also forcefully convert them to Christianity or the Catholic faith. Now this system, the Encomienda system, is an attempt by the Spanish to replicate what they were familiar with, feudalism. Now, feudalism is this hierarchy of social and racial classes that you see so often in Europe. Under feudalism, the warriors and the noblemen are above the peasants. So as applied in America, that meant the Native Americans are going to be considered the lowest class. However, sometimes the Spanish would intermarry with the natives, especially after spending a considerable amount of time in the Americas. And mestizo is the name for this, with, were people of mixed Spanish and Native American heritage, mestizo. Now, the Native Americans did not just simply comply with Spanish treatment. It wasn't like, okay, take me over, I'll be your slave, I'll adopt to the Catholic faith. Contrary to that, they would often resist Spanish treatment. Uh, in any attempt to make them adopt a different religion and culture. The very best example of this 
of course, is the Pueblo Revolt. This was an example of Native American resistance. In the Pueblo Revolt, Native Americans led an attack against the Spanish that would lead to the death of hundreds of Spanish, and they would also destroy any semblance of the Catholic faith. That meant Catholic churches were destroyed, priests were killed in an attempt to push out this culture that was encroaching upon them. So this is a great example of resistance, if you ever see a question about Native American resistance. Now, for the Spanish, they're doing pretty well. They're claiming lands in the America. They're the first really to do so. But early on for Spain, another rivalry threatened their claims to territory in the New World, and that was Portugal. Now, both Spain and Portugal are Catholic countries. So Spain took up the grievances between themselves and Portugal with the Pope, which is the head of the Catholic faith. And the Pope would end up deciding a treaty between Spain and Portugal, the Treaty of Tordesillas. In the Treaty of Tordesillas, which was decided by the Pope, it divided the Americas between Spain and Portugal. But as you'll see in the map on the next slide, Spain will get a much better end of this bargain. The treaty also said that neither country was to occupy any territory already in the hands of a Catholic ruler. Again, that gives Spain a huge advantage. Let's take a look at the map. You could see the Treaty of Tordesillas to the left, that's what Spain gets. To the right, that's what Portugal will get. And that's probably why Brazil today speaks Portuguese. If you didn't know that, it would go back to this time period. Now, another thing that we discussed in class is whether we should even consider Columbus's landing in the Americas to be a discovery, since other explorers like Leif Erikson have been here prior to Columbus, and, of course, the fact that Native Americans had lived here for thousands of years. Certainly, it was monumental, but was it a discovery? What do you think? Now here is a graph of the feudal system, or the caste system, that the Spanish tried to implement in the New World. You'll notice the highest on the social pyramid are the Spanish, born in Spain, the purebred. But the lowest on this is the African slaves, and just above them, Native American Indians. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But let's move on to Roman numeral 5, which is the Columbian Exchange. A very important concept from period 1 is the Columbian Exchange. Now, Columbus's arrival in the Americas had profound impacts beyond just exploration and discovery because it brought about this idea of the Columbian Exchange. Now, if you've never heard of this, the Columbian Exchange refers to the exchange of plants, animals, and diseases from the Old World, Europe and Africa, and the New World, the Americas. Now, when the very first explorer stepped off his ship for the very first time, without even realizing it, he was making catastrophic environmental changes to the world, because on his very clothing, there were germs and bacteria that were capable of wiping out entire populations. And not only that, on his ship were animals brought both intentionally, like livestock, and unintentionally brought over like rats that would invade the new land. That's why you've heard the term invasive species. In Florida, we have a huge problem with these huge iguanas that are taking over, or the pythons in the Everglades. These are invasive species, meaning they're not originally from Florida. Someone had it as a pet and let it loose, and they ultimately multiplied. Now, the Columbian Exchange would be much more catastrophic than that. Now, it's not trade. Sometimes I have students think that it was trade. Obviously, they're not going to be trading diseases, for instance. But the Columbian Exchange is very important. Now, for years, the Native Americans were isolated from the rest of the world. Remember, no one knew they were even there. Because of this, Native Americans had a very weak immunity 
lack of travel, lack of exposure. So when they come in contact with the Europeans for the first time, they're going to be exposed to germs and bacteria that they had never encountered, and this would wipe out an entire tribe easily. But the Columbian Exchange is important because for American history, it explains a number of different things. First, like I mentioned, it explains why the Indians died out, the death of the natives. Sometimes students assume that the natives died because Europeans came and killed them all in conquest. Now, of course, there will be some of that, but 90% of Native Americans were decimated by European diseases, most notably smallpox. And remember, it's because their immune system is not nearly as strong as the Europeans due to a lack of travel and exposure. The other thing that would decimate native tribes would be the exposure to animals. Uh, for example, livestock, cattle, and pigs would destroy Indian crops. Um, and so remember, these large civilizations had been for years centered around crops like the maize. But the Columbian Exchange also will explain to us why Europe would begin to prosper. Um, the introduction of corn and the potato which is not from Europe, it's actually from the Americas, would actually bring about huge population growth. So that's going to have a very significant impact on Europe. So Columbia Exchange explains the death of the natives, the prosperity of Europe. It'll also explain the introduction of African slave labor to work large plantations um, of tobacco and then later cotton we will begin to introduce African slaves uh, into the continent of the Americas. And that's going to be a huge topic that we're going to be covering a lot in American history. Now this is an important chart that I like to show students. Uh, you could look and see the different things that are going back and forth between the old world and the new world. Remember, this is the Columbian Exchange, the exchange of plants, animals, and diseases. Um, this chart shows some of the prominent ones that I highlighted in red. The tomato, originally from the Americas, but of course, we know it from Italy. Um, but other things will have a huge impact. Things like horses and guns transform the way of life for Native Americans. So all of these things are significant. You notice I underlined a number of different diseases. Now most of the diseases are coming from the Old World into the Americas, because remember, the natives have a weak immunity to these things. Now let's move on to Roman numeral 6, which is French settlements. Now, Spain's dominance in exploration we talked a great deal about, and it brought great financial success for Spain and, of course, power. But Spain would not remain the only country to benefit from New World colonization. The rival nation of France would soon begin sending voyages to the Americas also. Now, much of the French settlements were much further north, today what we know of as Canada. One of their larger settlements was in Quebec along the St. Lawrence River. Now, rather than come to conquer and plunder, as was more common with the Spanish, the French typically came in smaller numbers, and they traded with Na Native Americans uh, most notably for furs. Now trade, of course, will help establish relationships based more on equality rather than hierarchy. Therefore, we see much friendlier relationships established between the French and the Native Americans than we do with any of the other European groups that will come to the New World. The French would also intermarry with the Natives, which we saw some of with the Spanish. Uh, another thing that's important with regards to the French is that even though the explorers of the 16th century demonstrated that the American continents are a true barrier to a short route to Asia, there still remained hope that maybe there is a natural water passage that could be found leading directly through the barrier, through the continent, to get to a quicker route to Asia. And the French still held on to that hope of finding the Northwest Passage. And you can see uh, on the next slide, 
what that would look like. So here it shows you the Northwest Passage, the water route to Asia. Obviously, very difficult water route in such a cold region. Now, Roman numeral seven is England's imperial desires. We're going to spend uh, much more time on England than any of the other groups. Um, however, for England, they were slow um, in starting voyages of exploration for a variety of reasons. Um, political, religious turmoil inside England prevented them from focusing on any possibility of settlements in the Americas. Now, we could discuss all that that entailed, but I don't think for our purposes that is necessary. To simplify, we could just point to a significant change in England under the reign of Queen Elizabeth I and her establishment of England as a Protestant nation. Now let me stop there and explain a couple terms for you. We know now that Spain was Catholic, um, which means they were Christian, but under the leadership of the Pope. To be Protestant simply means to be a non-Catholic Christian. And as you know from studying the Protestant Reformation in world history class. So for instance, if you say you are a Baptist, then you are Protestant. You are a non-Catholic Christian. Well, during this time, and really during much of modern history, there's a struggle or rivalry between Catholics and Protestants. Though they believe very similar concepts, including the Trinity and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there are significant differences that divided the two groups. Um, still somewhat even today. So back in England, the country, though, was finally united. The political and religious tensions of the past had died down, and they are ready to begin to enter the sport of exploration. However, due to years of turmoil, uh, financing such a trip is going to be much more difficult for England. So instead, many early English explorations were led by pirates. Uh, a good example of this is Sir Francis Drake. Um, countless victories Sir Francis Drake would lead against the Spanish fleets, meaning as a pirate, he's going with the intention of robbing from the Spanish, plundering what they had found and what they had done. Now, F Sir Francis Drake would go on to do a number of accomplishments on his own, including being the first Englishman to circumnavigate the globe and come back alive. That's a pretty big deal. But England's first few attempts are going to be done through pirates or robbing from what others had found. Now here's a picture of Elizabeth I. The reason I mentioned her is just because of the change that will take place in England, which will give them the opportunity to launch a series of voyages to the New World. Now, England's early attempts at actually settling in the New World did not go as planned. In uh, 1585, and this is one of my favorite stories, an English crew with a hundred people set sail for the New World, this time with the goal of a permanent settlement. They were going to stay. The crew landed off the coast of today, North Carolina, and they named their colony Roanoke Island. Homes were built, and the people began to call this their home. The captain and the crew then decided they were going to go back to England to get more supplies, to pick up more people, to help this colony grow. But the captain and crew were delayed for over a year until they could get back. But when they did come back, they were shocked because what they had found was the colony at Roanoke Island had disappeared. It had vanished. All that they would find is the bones of one man and the word Croatoan carved on a post. No one knew, and no one knows still, what these words actually meant. No one knew, no one knows today, what happened to this colony. Why only the bones of one individual? What happened to the rest? Could they have been captured by hostile Spanish coming up from the south? Or did they join Native Americans for the purpose of survival? There's no proof for any of this. So still to this day, Roanoke Island is a mystery of history yet to be solved. What do you think happened? Now, 
For England, this is going to be terribly disappointing, as you can imagine. Now, Roman numeral 8, things are about to change with the defeat of the Spanish Armada. Now, in late 1580s, the English pirate raids against the Spanish uh, infuriated them. They were angry by the English continual pirate attacks. And so they decided to take action. The Spanish Armada was known as the Invincible Armada. They were the most powerful fighting force in the world at the time. And they decided that they would launch an attack against England to punish them for these pirate adventures at sea. And the attack against England consisted of 130 ships, part of their armada, and almost 20,000 soldiers. They had no doubt that they were going to win. The English defense was led by Sir Francis Drake, the English pirate. But things began to change quickly, and I love this part of the story. Due to heavy storms at sea, the massive Spanish Armada was scattered. And it wasn't the Spanish that came out victorious, it was the English. Now keep in mind, of course, I should point this out, A push does not test on military history. Yet I took the time to talk about the defeat of the Spanish Armada because it is an important uh, conflict, not because of what happened, but because of the outcome. England's surprising defeat of the Invincible Armada would make England a world-class power. The dominance of Spain would now come under question. You could say that the defeat of the Spanish Armada is a turning point in history. The English said it this way, God blew and they were scattered. They credited God for their victory. So, this is a turning point in exploration. What I mean by this is that prior to this event, Spain dominated in exploration and colonization. But after this event, after the defeat of the Spanish Armada, England would take the lead. So it's an important event because of the outcome. Now, following the defeat of the Spanish Armada is a period of national pride, this desire We've got to explore. We've got to establish ourselves, build our kingdom. But there's going to be a big difference in the model that is used between the Spanish and the English. We talked about Spain, how when they planted the first settlements, they used this feudalism model or this hierarchy of social classes. It'll be different for the English. They're going to use a capitalism model that those that come are going to do whatever they can to try to make a profit for themselves and for joint stock companies. Individuals still could not afford to finance a trip, just like Columbus couldn't have. But for England, it's going to be different than Spain. Rather than going to the monarchs to sponsor voyages, now some of that will happen, but something unique will also happen with England. They will use what become known as joint stock companies, like the Virginia Company of London. These joint stock companies would gather money from rich investors hoping to make a profit from gold or whatever in America. The money would be used to pay for ships, crew, supplies, everything you would need. The investors themselves never went to America, but they certainly expected those that did to send back a return on the profit for them. It's a capitalist investment opportunity the same concept that we use in our stock market today. What this meant is that individuals had a stake in the success of the colony. You're not living off the government's money, so to speak. So these early English explorers, especially in the first couple colonies, are going to be motivated by riches and gold. Now later there's going to be other motivations, of course, religion, as we talk about the pilgrims. But early on, Gold and riches is going to be a primary motivating factor for England. Now finally, Roman numeral 9 is, let's take some time to compare the different modes of colonization. We talked mainly about three different groups, and I want to break down the three major powers in the New World and how they were similar and how they were different. These similarities and differences can be easily memorized and will be helpful for you if you're ever to be asked to compare and contrast these groups. Let's look at Spain first. 
we discussed that the first explorers were conquistadors. Remember that meant they came for gold and souls. When it came to government control, though, for Spain, um, the Spanish allowed for very little freedom for the settlers when it came to self-rule. They had a tight control of the colonization process. When it came to Native Americans, the Spanish would often attempt to convert or exploit the natives. We talked a great deal about the encomienda system, and that was something that was unique to the Spanish explorers. Now let's look at the French. The French, you might remember, sent fewer settlers in general. They would settle further north, um, remember Quebec. They would establish trade alliances between themselves and the Indians, which meant that they were was a more friendly relationship with the Native Americans in general with uh, the French. Um, and then England, finally. Many of the colonies started m much larger with a lot more people coming from England than the other groups, and that is because they intended to stay for the long haul. Most would become farmers. Uh, in regards to government control, this is going to be another thing that's really unique for England, maybe the most unique, is that England would allow for some self-government. Freedom was granted to local governments. This would be a trend that we'll, we'll see that will ultimately lead to a revolution to, to fight for complete self-rule. Now, this wouldn't happen in Spain or the French colonies. It was because they were allowed for these self-government, self-rule in the beginning that they would always want more. In regards to Native Americans, uh, for the most part, the English preferred to be separate from the natives. You won't see Indian slavery, for the most part, like we did in the Spanish colonies. And you're not going to see intermarriage with the Native Americans, for the most part, when it comes to the English. Now, all three of these groups obviously want to use it as an expansion of their territory. They want to use it for profit. But here shows you some varying differences between the different groups. Well, now that's it for period one. I hope you found this video helpful. Uh, there's going to be many more coming out soon. Now, please leave a comment and be sure to subscribe to my channel for upcoming videos. Thank you for watching.